Okay. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Good morning, wherever you are. And thank you for joining us to this uh, uh, first session of this um, uh, IEEE Young Professional uh, Seminar Series and the HVL Data Science uh, Research Group. Uh, I am delighted to today we have a Baran joining us to, to talk about this uh, resilience for infrastructure. And yeah, so just before I introduce Baran, I want to say that this uh, uh, seminar series uh, is a joint effort between IEEE Norway and also the or, uh, research group in, in HVL. Uh, or Western Norway University of Applied Science. We are located in Bergen. However, we have five different campuses in the Western part of the Norway. And uh, the university is uh, between uh, around uh, 16,000 students, um, 2,000 staff. So we are in something around 18 to 19,000 uh, organization. So check our website, hvl.no uh, slash AI or HVL Data Science Group. And uh, we will be happy to hear more from you after this and your feedback so we can continue in a, in a better way uh, with this seminar series. So saying that, let's just talk about what we did here today. So, Baran, Professor Baran Olak is assistant professor in smart mobility and transportation engineering in the University of Twente in Netherlands. Uh, prior joining the Twente, he was postdoctoral uh, uh, associate with the civil engineering department in Stony Brook University in the US. And he got uh, his PhD uh, from civil engineering and environment uh, engineering and in Florida State University. Well, I had the pleasure of working with Baran while I was in FSU and uh, in a long collaboration uh, and, and it was very fruitful. Uh, and, and before uh, Baran joined FSU, uh, he got his master in Politecnica di Milano and a bachelor in civil engineering from Middle East Technical University in Turkey. So I'm, very, I'm really amazed Baran with your international and diverse backgrounds and the research that you are doing in the combination of the transportation, safety, mobility, accessibility, and the way you use uh, data science and machine learning in your uh, study. So floor is yours, yeah. Uh, thank you, Reza. Uh, it was very nice introduction. Uh, yeah, maybe I can start sharing my screen and the presentation I have. Um, so yeah, so meanwhile, you, you share your screen, just some logistics. If you have any questions, please, please write it in the chat section. Uh, after Baran finishes his presentation, we go through the, the questions and depending on the time, we, the Mushtawa, the moderator will ask the question or, or un unmute you to ask the questions by yourself. Yeah. Okay, uh, so today, uh, I want to talk about a topic I, which I called understanding the resilience through data analysis. And uh, as yeah, uh, Reza introduced me, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Twente in the Netherlands, uh, working in the transportation engineering and management group. So uh, Reza already talked most of this stuff. So I put this <laughs> introduction uh, slide for me, but yeah, if you also want to get more information uh, or look at, have a look at the recent research we are doing, you can go to this uh, link as well and uh, in our university website. Uh, as Reza said, uh, my background is actually based on civil engineering and transportation engineering. I, when I started my PhD, I started working on topics like safety, um, traffic safety, and uh, smart mobility accessibility issues. But then uh, living in Florida, uh, and Reza would know as well, uh, you are exposed to hurricanes and disasters, right? So I couldn't resist myself to go into the resilience and disaster uh, assessment issues uh, because we were also affected and we were also working there uh, together with the power group, which Reza was part of. And uh, yeah, we, we had a long collaboration working together. I, 
when we first met, I was a PhD student. He was an assistant professor, <laughs> but then uh, years passed and we are now here. So, um, and as you can see from my background, I am, a, I am not a computer scientist. Uh, I am not like a, a mathematician and so on. I'm a civil engineer. So uh, I always see this um, data analysis and machine learning and these kind of topics like as a part of, as a tool for, for the end result. And in my opinion, uh, and from my perspective, of course, uh, this, the end result, which is, for example, improving resilience or assessing the disaster outcomes is always more important. And in, in this presentation, I will also uh, focus more on this. Um, I will, of course, uh, try to show you how we try to uh, overcome the problems or like assess the disaster outcomes and so on. But mostly I will focus on uh, the input and output of, the, of this, um, let's say, uh, studies. So uh, first to put into perspective why resilience is an important topic, I want to show you a couple of information from the, um, the research and innovation frameworks of different uh, organizations. For example, in European Union, uh, there is, you know, uh, missions in Horizon Europe. And actually two of these uh, missions are really focused on the smart city resilience, disaster outcomes, and social transformation uh, kind of issues. So this is really the hot, one of the hot topics in European Union and research in the European Union currently. But also in the US, for example, uh, Nation Science Foundation, one of the missions is sustainable civil infrastructure and distributed infrastructure networks, which will focus on the, uh, the, the climate change and the, the, the resisting the, these issues, which is related with the resilience. So also in resilience, we, we are uh, dealing with now emerging problems. And these emerging problems include the increasing intensity and frequency of disasters. Uh, with the climate change and everything and the, the, the human change, uh, social transformation, we see that the frequency and the intensity of uh, disasters are increasing. But also another thing we see is increasing interactions and dependence be dependencies between infrastructure systems. Because uh, from an example from transportation, like 10, 20 years ago, when you say transportation, it was an mostly independent system because cars were not connected they were working on oil gas you know um, and then yeah you, you you can lose power you can lose information infrastructure but not not much thing will happen in the transportation but now we see a transition a technological and energy transition which will shift uh, that transformation uh, transportation will be highly connected to power infrastructure because of the electric vehicles but also information infra information technology infrastructure because of the necessity of the, the smartness and connectedness but this is also valid for most of other uh, infrastructure systems so everything becomes more interacted more in, in the interdependent to each other so uh, we also mentioned a little bit, but we also see unprecedented events uh, and uh, impacts due to climate change. But we can now extend this to, for example, the effect of the COVID. Of course, the COVID is not the first pandemic that the world sees, but um, it was, last one was, we can say, almost 100 years ago. And the world and everything was much more different. People were not traveling this much and uh, the technology was not this much uh, this um, advanced. So now we see a different effect. We see a different uh, thing. So we always see unprecedented events. So we need to be prepared. Finally, a uh, very important issue is the resilience divide between the different populations. Now, uh, even with the COVID, but also in the other disasters, we see that there's a huge difference between population groups. As for example, the income levels are different. So lower income individuals usually are much more affected than the higher income individuals. So there's, an, there's this resilience divide between the population groups. So these are the emerging problems that we need to focus. And uh, these are the emerging problems that we need to deal with in the resilience engineering. And to do this, uh, we, we need tools, right? Uh, we know that uh, resilience domain change, I mean, spans from rare events to day-to-day -day incidents. And uh, for example, this is disasters are kind of rare events, even though they are increasing their frequency. So in this domain, in this span, we see that event frequency is changing, right? In, the, in the, this part that we see very few events and day-to-day -day incidents, we observe very large, uh, very, too many events. Uh, but in this span, we also see that data size is, size is changing as well. In the rare events, we see usually 
uh, very small data, sparse data. And when the frequency is increasing, we see very big data we need to process. So this bring us, brings us to uh, formulate different ways, different approach to overcome this, uh, to analyze these problems. And this brings us to the data analysis issue. So we need to use all our arsenal. And uh, of course, this is not a full list, but uh, there are lots of different things that we need to discover. And uh, yeah, I, I believe uh, our uh, listeners here has be different backgrounds and maybe there are lots of computer scientists here who would be much more experienced and expert on these topics. But we are trying to draw, we are trying to borrow these uh, methods from, from this uh, statistics, uh, computer science and, and so on. So we can deal with these different types of problems that we see. So, uh, Going back to the question, what we should do? We should uh, enhance the urban resilience. But when we say urban resilience, uh, maybe you have never worked on the resilience, uh, I'm sure here, but uh, it's a multifaceted problem, okay? And we, we, uh, we deal with sociodemographic groups, we deal with infrastructure, we deal with interactions of both, there are governance problems, not even we are, uh, I mean, in the engineering part, we are not looking that much, but uh, there are lots of different problems and a multifaceted, uh, faceted concept. So the question is how we can quantify the resilience. So one of the ways is to backtrack the recovering, uh, power outage recovery uh, in time and try to reconstruct the, the, um, the outages and the effects of these disasters. But also uh, we face a problem in this uh, because we say physical infrastructure recovery, but this does not necessarily indicate that urban activities can bounce back to the pre-disaster conditions because uh, we know that there are lots of uh, outcomes of disasters that will change the lives of the people. For, for example, the recent uh, thing uh, in the Hurricane Michael a couple of years ago in Florida, it was really devastating. And, these effects are still ongoing and probably they recovered, I mean, they rebuilt the most of the infrastructure, but many people lost their houses, lost their jobs, they moved to other cities. So they, it completely changed the area that a disaster strikes. So uh, this the physical infrastructure recovery doesn't always mean that urban activities can bounce back. Uh, because also our restoration of the urban activities depends on the residential commercial areas served by the infrastructure, but also connections with the other critical facilities like the health education, right? So uh, we say urban residence is a multifaceted assessment, uh, right? It requires this kind of assessment. So we say urban residence, there is critical facility aspect. By critical facility, we mean, for example, hospitals, uh, we mean uh, security, like the police stations and so on, and the firefighters as well. Uh, so there is one of these aspects. Another aspect is infrastructure like the, the connections, the transportation, power, information, all these different kinds of infrastructure, because we know that in case of a disaster or in case of a, a threat, we know that, for example, infrastructure, uh, uh, the information technology infrastructure can collapse as well, which will prevent almost all uh, recovery operations. Uh, another aspect we can talk about is the socioeconomic aspect of the people. So for example, uh, higher income people are more resilient to disasters because they can they have the means, for example, for evacuation from area or after post post uh, disaster they can they have means to get the necessary resources. But for lower income populations, we see there's a different story. And finally, demographic aspect, right? In the demographic aspect, we can talk about different age groups, different education levels, different uh, kinds of people, different cultures. Uh, how you deal with the uh, resilience situation. Some cultures may be more prepared uh, to, to disasters and uh, effects of disasters than others. So these are all different facets of the uh, resilience assessment process. So finally, what do uh, I will talk about, uh, which I call three pillars of analysis. Of course, this is our three pillars of analysis, we can say. But the first pillar, we can say assessment, what happened? after what, what's going on, right? The first pillar is the assessment. The second pillar is the prescription. So what can we do? How we can change things? What, what kind of measures we can take? And finally, we can maybe talk about prevention. And the prevention means how we can uh, improve the, for example, infrastructure. So 
we won't have to deal with uh, effects of the outcomes of the disasters again. So these three pillars that I will try to cover and I will show how we, uh, which kind of methods we try to develop to, to, to address these issues. So for that, I first want to talk about all of the studies that will I talk about focus on the same area, more or less, because we had really, uh, let's say, uh, good data for, for this area. And this is uh, in the United States, the Florida area, which uh, again, Reza and me uh, lived in Tallahassee for a while. Uh, I studied there and uh, throughout my studies, uh, three hurricanes actually hit uh, the, the Tallahassee area in Florida and Tallahassee is the capital of the Florida as well. And these hurricanes was, um, uh, were um, Hurricane Herman, Hurricane Erman, Hurricane Michael. And the most affected was affecting was uh, Hurricane Herman. And it hit in 2016. And after the hurricane hit, almost, let's say, 80% uh, of the customers, like 93,000 people were out of power for, for several hours and several days in some cases. So we mostly work on this data and try to discover these three pillars of analysis that I mentioned. So the first pillar that I will talk about is assessment. And for assessment, uh, what we did is to we include power infrastructure, including power lines, uh, circuit breakers, transformers. These are the components in the power infrastructure. Uh, and Reza, much more experienced than uh, me about them. Uh, we also include failed power components. Okay. And uh, hopefully, we had a relationship with the uh, municipality of Tallahassee that provides. Uh, that governs the power uh, network as well. So they can provide us the failed network components. And finally, we include sociodemographics into analysis, our analysis into, in order to make a good assessment of resilience. So uh, for, for this first, uh, first assessment part, uh, what we did is essentially a data processing process because what we know about the disaster outcome was the failed components. But we actually didn't know which customers didn't have uh, power or which customers did have power because it's like, like a 125,000 people. So what we need to do was we need to reconstruct the network and the, we need to reconstruct the, the, the hierarchies in the network so we could understand which component failure affected which customers. So, but think about there are different levels. It's not just the let's say individual household there is for example a failure in the in the circuit breaker which would affect the whole feeder sub network which could affect thousands of people so we we need to reconstruct these hierarchies in the network so we could understand which customers actually had uh, power outages and after that of course the next step for us was to uh, to uh, uh, distinguish households that lost power and this uh, that ones that have power. And to do this, we identify which households, of course, has and don't, don't have uh, power. And then we try to identify their uh, type of physical infrastructure they have, the customer type, like the residential, commercial uh, customers. We need to identify income levels. We need to identify uh, demographics and, for example, criticality of these, uh, these customers. I say household, but there's also like the facilities like hospitals, for example, within this network, right? So the criticality of the, the household. So this process was also a, a simulation uh, we can say more or less was it like a simulation because for the demographics, for example, for the socioeconomics, we, what we know is, is like an upper level data because we know the areas with different socio-demographic groups, but we need to assign and simulate this, uh, which customer is, for example, higher income, which customer is lower income and so on. So, but this is essentially the assessment was done essentially by a data processing process. So, what we also did is we tried to temporarily reconstruct the, the power arches. And this is Talese area and each dot that very small dots you can see in the screen are the customers and the, the yellow ones are the ones that have power and the rest is doesn't have power. And when we reconstruct these power outages, we see that uh, over the time, of course, the people who have the power is changing. Okay, And it took almost uh, 200 hours, which you can think about eight, nine days to fully uh, recover from the, these outages. So 
uh, think about like in your lives, think about not having power for almost 10 days. It is it's really difficult because when you don't have power, you cannot make anything work. You don't have hot water to shower even like, or to, to survive. You cannot cook in most cases. Uh, if, if your uh, cooking uh, equipments are working with electricity. But I mean, you can imagine that when you don't have power, you cannot essentially continue your life. So uh, this is, at the end, we have this kind of power outages uh, uh, pattern, let's say, okay, and the restoration times. So using this information, we try to uh, identify what kind of uh, like the infrastructure components, demographics, socioeconomics have uh, restored their power. So the first thing uh, we look at is the, in, the, in terms of resilience divide, we look at different types of uh, customers. We know that some of the uh, these uh, dots that you see on the map was commercial customers and some of them was um, were residential customers. So when we look at that, we see that commercial customers has had more uh, resilient in that sense because they had more power in the beginning, as you can see here, and they, they recovery, uh, it was more or less same, but they, they always have more power than the residential customers. Maybe we can expect this. Uh, maybe uh, we can expect that commercial areas have more resilience. Another thing we look at is more towards the infrastructure, uh, let's say, aspect. We see that uh, we distinguish the network type as the like the overhead lines and underground lines. As you can imagine, the power lines can be overhead or underground. And of course, uh, what we see is underground lines were uh, more, let's say, uh, resilient than the overhead lines. This is something we expect. Uh, I think very striking result was about the income levels. What we see is, uh, as you can see in this, these two figures shows income levels and the purple line uh, is the highest income and the yellow line is the lowest income and the white is average, white line is the average, okay? So what we see is the more the income of a household, the more the resident they are. So we, we can see that the least resilient people are the least lowest income people. So this is really a big problem because we know that this is based on infrastructure, by, by the way. So, uh, but we also know that high income people, as I mentioned, are more resilient because they have more means to recover from an, a disaster impact. Like they can, for example, move to a, let's say hotel or some, some other accommodation to spend their time during these recovery operations. But lower income people doesn't have this opportunity. So this is a very big problem. This, uh, this clearly shows the residence divide in different populations. And finally, we look at different facilities. And we see that, uh, for example, hospitals, uh, almost 40% of the hospitals lost power and it didn't recover until the almost, I don't know, the fourth day maybe, yeah. So this is, this is also a very big problem because you can imagine what can uh, losing power in a hospital can cause, right? Uh, also, we see different kind of things. Uh, one of the critical things was assisted living and nursing facilities, which was really terrible in terms of uh, resilience. And this is really critical because, you know, uh, these are uh, elderly people who need assisting and nursing uh, for all the time. So this, this is really shows the, the uh, weakness or the vulnerability of the system as a, as a whole, when we look at the whole city as a system. So uh, residence divide remarks, we can say underground lines better. Uh, they are expensive, but it can benefit. Yeah, the income is really uh, important in the residence. And we see that we need to increase the residence of at least lower income individuals. Uh, and yeah, uh, it's important to know that a system can be as resilient as the least resilient element in, the, in that system. Because when we talk about a city, the, the city is working all together, right? You need to, you need all components, including all demographic groups, socioeconomic groups, but also all facilities to, to work in order to system to work. So this is really important for the whole system. And, um, the, we should know that resilience is not homogeneous throughout the area. So there are differences between areas, groups, and uh, facilities. So the question is how we can close this divide, right? And this brings us to prescription uh, part of the triplets of the analysis. And for this, uh, we try to understand how we can improve power infrastructure. 
and for this purpose, we use essentially three, three uh, approaches. The first extreme value model, then Cox proportion hazards model, and uh, Monte Carlo simulation. And I will go to details of this. So the first in this uh, prescription framework, uh, the important thing is to acquire necessary data. As I mentioned, there are these different facets of, uh, facets of uh, resilience and disaster outcomes, socio-technical features, infrastructure components, component connectivity and operational decisions are all parts of these uh, necessary data sets. Then we have modeling part in this framework, component failure model, power restoration model. Okay, and I will come to the in details of this. Then we need to conduct simulations to understand what happens under different scenarios, right? So uh, as we know, the disasters are rare events, uh, and then we don't know how they hit. So to understand the overall effects of, uh, of these uh, potential disasters, we need to conduct lots of simulations. And finally, it brings us to outcomes. Right and decision criteria. So every kind of uh, measure, let's say, has a cost and has a benefit. So what are the costs and benefits? So do we need a cost-benefit uh, analysis. And finally, the decision. So decision making. We need investment decisions in order to improve our infrastructure. So the first part I want to talk about is uh, in this framework is the power uh, network component failure model. Uh, so we, what we did is we modeled the component failures based on the, the hurricane data from the Florida uh, as a binary extreme value model. And the, the binary extreme value model is suitable for uh, rare failures, essentially. So we can say component failures are also rare failures. They essentially, in the, the model, we use product predictors as component age, uh, so the age of the component and the neighborhood age where they located. Of course, we can, uh, we couldn't because the data didn't allow, but it's possible to add more predictors to this, this list. Um, and the model essentially is an, uh, like a binary choice model, uh, but it's of course there are some differences. Uh, in here, P is the probability of event E to be a failure. So we have the data which components are failed. Uh, and essentially the, the, for example, the FJ here is a smoothing function for the predictors X predictors like the component age and neighborhood age. And of course, we needed to predict these uh, parameters of the model. And uh, the smoothing functions gives us the nonlinear effect of the neighborhood age. So how neighborhood age is affecting the, the less we can say failure probability, right? So because we expect that it is nonlinear because there are lots of different things. Older components we can expect to fail, all, all the neighborhoods we can expect to have uh, older components, but sometimes it's not the case. Sometimes they have changed. So we expect some nonlinear effects of neighborhood age. The next part was the power restoration model. So we first we have the failure, right? We can now simulate the failures. Now we need to find the restorations. So for this, we use Cox proportional hazards model. And uh, as name suggests, it is it's, it's to model the hazards. Uh, but in this case, uh, we use this for different purpose. We try to understand restoration times using this hazards model. But essentially, the, the, uh, we, we, what we did is we convert this to a survival model. And this is very common. This model is very commonly used in uh, medical studies, for example, or in reliability engineering. Uh, in medical studies, for example, they, they try to understand the survivability of uh, patients of uh, different diseases or the effects of drugs, for example. What we did is uh, we used the same idea, but we tried to model the power restoration time. So how, how long does it take? And I, I will clearly show that in, in a figure in a moment, but uh, essentially this model has the survival function. And this is, an, uh, let's say, non-parametric uh, function, so that it's not estimated by a distribution, probable distribution, but it's more non-parametric and empirical. And uh, again, like uh, betas are coefficients, it's just a general uh, linear model, let's say. And yeah, as this is a baseline survival function. So uh, we also add one more step in the power restoration model. And you can guess that components that are closer to each other are more likely to be repaired earlier than further away in isolated ones because these are basically repaired by creaves and a creave can just 
uh, very quickly go and like when they fix multiple ones if they are close enough, but they need to dispatch uh, for long distance uh, to other locations. So they, they are more likely to be repaired later than the, the closer ones. So what we did is we uh, developed the component closing centrality index. And in this index, basically, we look at how a component is central in the in the whole uh, full picture of outages, uh, component outages, let's say component failures. So this, this is very simple index, let's say this is an uh, indicator function if uh, a component is close to uh, other like less than one minute close to other components, we say it's one and otherwise zero, just divided by the total uh, free flow of travel time. So this, this gives us the closeness centrality of each component. So uh, again, we have some predictors in this uh, survival model as well. Number of customers, centrality, uh, underground feeder percentage, we see underground feeders are more RSA resilient, so they have a, a quicker or maybe uh, the model will show that longer uh, repair times, uh, component age, neighborhood age, number of hospitals connected to the feeder sub network. So uh, always we think that criticality has an effect on the restoration time because if there's a critical component, it will be uh, it is more likely to be repaired earlier. Uh, number of emergency facilities connected to the feeder sub network, uh, number of market groceries. Uh, connected to feeder and number of people from low, medium and high density residential areas and cost, uh, commercial customers as well. So the result was uh, this, uh, we can show this in this figure. So in here, uh, left hand side, you see baseline survival functions based on different components. And uh, if you are familiar with this power networks, you would notice that this figure actually shows us the uh, component hierarchy as well. So the circuit breakers is one of the highest hierarchy com part, uh, components in the power network. So we see that they are the, the ones that are most early uh, recovered ones, restored ones. And uh, when we apply our model, we see that different uh, uh, restoration durations based on component types. And again, this is more or less in the hierarchy of the power network, but this is, uh, we see that, for example, service points are almost individual customers and they, they are, they have some of them has the latest restoration times. So uh, when we come to simulation, what we did is we uh, try to simulate 10, 100 different uh, failure scenarios. Of course, we can go up to 1000, 10,000, but there's also a computational part of it. So Scenario has, uh, each scenario has two parts. Uh, one of them is a Bernoulli trial to understand the failures, uh, right? Uh, if a component will fail or not. And uh, RD is modeled by the survival model that will duration of that component to be restored, okay? And this, this, uh, this part shows us each component will fail and how much it will take. And for, for all set of uh, components, we conduct this scenario, for example, each scenario, and then identify which customers will be out of power and for, for how long duration. And then we did this a hundred times. Uh, and at the end, we what we found is uh, what will happen if we change something. So this is, remember that this part is about prescription. So we try to test the alternative actions. So of course, uh, there are different uh, improvement scenarios are possible, but what we tried is to see what happens if we uh, change, replace components that are five, 10 and 15 years old, uh, right? If, if a component is older than 15 years old, we want to change it. And what we tried second as a second set is to reduce the component restoration duration. So the, so the first one is basically pre-disaster, like, you can do some actions to fix, uh, change some components. So it is improving the infrastructure. The second one is, is a response action, right? After the disaster, you can increase the number of your emergency creeps that will go and fix these components. So what will happen? We, we want to see that. So what we did is to uh, try if you, what happens we, if you reduce the component recovery duration by 10, 20, and 30%. So, uh, by doing so, we see how number percent of customers with power is changing 
after the disaster based on our scenarios. And of course, we tried renewing components and reducing restoration time. And these, these uh, figures based on income of different uh, customers. But essentially what we see is uh, renewing the components is essentially increasing the initial resilience. So in the first case, base, ca base uh, case scenario, we see that uh, more or less 35% of customers only have power. But if you change, for example, of course, we have different results for that. But uh, if you change 10 years old components, uh, we increase that almost to 55% of the customers have power after a disaster similar to happened in the Tallahassee. Uh, but also we see that restoration, uh, reducing the restoration time doesn't change the initial uh, resilience of the system, but it can of course improve the recovery duration, so it will also have an effect, but changing the components, improving the infrastructure has the most effect. This is, this is clear. Uh, when we look at incomes of different groups, even in the base case scenario, but also changing renewable components, uh, we always see, uh, uh, let's say, a similar pattern. If you look at uh, these colors, uh, and this is the highest income group, right? And the red one is the base, the red one is the, the reference category is the lowest income people, uh, lower than $25,000 per year households. So we always see that higher income people are more resilient than uh, the lower income people. So even though we do some infrastructure improvement, uh, even though we renew the uh, reduce the restoration time, this doesn't change. It's always higher income, more resilient, lower income, less resilient. So I think as resilience uh, researchers, let's say, it's also our duty to look at these kind of societal problems. So what we can do is uh, we can have targeted policies for social equity. So this is a more detailed figure that I showed in the first. Uh, this is based on individual customers always, almost, and this is a scenario result that we did. And uh, we see what is the duration of the restoration. And we can also look at, um, there are different feeder subnetworks in, in Tallahassee, and we can also identify these feeder subnetworks based on average income. So in city of Tallahassee, we see that these area, the, the, this purple uh, pink area has the lowest income uh, people. So what, one of the things that we can do is actually, we can target these components, right? So we have these uh, components in the city, the, the blue ones are the larger income and the red one is the lowest income people, components that serve lowest income people. So essentially we can change these components, right? To target and to, to attain the social equity aspect. And actually when we do this with, with, within this uh, study, we see that we, there's a large improvement in the, in the um, Re resilience of the lower income people. So this is before renewal of these components only. And this is after renewal of these components only, what we see in the city. And now the, you can see that image is almost mirrored, right? So lower income people have more resilience, higher income people has less resilience and more uh, higher income people. So this is not, we, we can now discuss if is it fair for the higher income people, but you know, uh, it, the, ideally we can, replace all components, we can do amazing restoration, but it's not realistic. So, uh, because there's always budget limitations. So the question is, is doing everywhere equally is also fair or not? Because we already discussed that it's all very well known is higher income people is always have more resilience because they have also financial means. Uh, so to address these kind of inequalities in the, in the population, uh, we can always use this kind of uh, methodological uh, frameworks to, to identify which kind of uh, improvements we should make. So data analysis, data science can help us to target social problems as well. So the last pillar I want to talk is the prevention, so infrastructure improvement. And then for that, uh, what we did uh, in this study that you can show, see here is we try to uh, merge different parts of the infrastructure and also infrastructure, including the facilities and the land use. 
So for that, we have facilities, critical facilities in the city. We have land use types like the residential, commercial, institutional. And we also, we also have the infrastructure components like the power lines, roadways, and we merge these different infrastructure. Of course, uh, as a, for example, extension of the study, we could include information technology infrastructure here, which would be very, very nice actually. So what we did is we just combine all of these networks and we try to understand which parts of the components should be improved to increase the resilience. So for this purpose, we actually developed a couple of uh, indices, we can say. The first one was the vulnerability index. So basically, this is also a simple function, we can say. Uh, so this, this shows us if there's a closure, we say that it's an indicator function, we say one. If there's no closure, it's, it's of course zero, right? And then by just multiplying, taking square, multiplying this, we kind of find the vulnerability index that I will show the results as well. The next thing that we use is the priority index. And priority index, we use uh, some coefficients that I will show, uh, and also the extent and magnitude of the factor. For example, for hospitals, this can be a number of uh, beds. Uh, we just try to find which network components, power network components, has more priority depending on the facilities they are serving. So for that idea, for example, uh, the factor, the hospitals, we identify their priority scores based on uh, per bed, for example, if there's a 500 bed, we multiply that. And when you look at here, this total score, it's the, it shows us the, 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 the importance of, for example, hospitals in the total network. So it's 0 0.193 is a total weight of the hospitals in the, in the whole system. So we have these different uh, values. And I remember this, uh, it has been some time since the study, but we have some coefficients uh, we identify based on the literature, previous studies and so on. We uh, try to come up with these coefficients. And then once we identify the vulnerability and priority index, we try to come up with, sorry, this is a typo, but the name is the resilience need. This is the resilience need uh, uh, equation, which basically multiplies vulnerability and priority in this indices, uh, normalizing with the maxima, maximum of this uh, multiplication. So this actually gives us which network components in the, in the system needs more resilience in order to address these vulnerabilities and priorities. This is, these are very simple metrics. Uh, it's not like they are almost no brainer, but uh, even the simple things can really help us to analyze these kinds of things. We always need to think about it. So uh, I want to show how this worked actually in visually. So we have, uh, we had a merged infrastructure network. So we merge all of these uh, different roadway power networks together to have a merge combined infrastructure. Then we put uh, the land use variables on top of this network, right? The next thing we did was we put critical facilities on top of this network, right? And then at the end, we all combine this. So land use and critical facilities gave us actually the, the priority index, okay? So we have which uh, networks, which components of the network has more priority in the, in the system. And then next thing was to including the effect of the hurricane, okay, uh, Hurricane Herman in this case, we try to identify the vulnerability of the network, which network components are more vulnerable to this kind of impacts. And then finally, combining the two, we can find the resilience need. So this is, I think, uh, a very practical and important uh, information because then the, the governments, municipalities can just go to these locations and uh, try to improve these parts of the network. So uh, this is, uh, I can say the end of my presentation. Uh, and yeah, these, these are the sources that we, as you can see, we have a couple of studies with uh, Reza uh, and then yeah, they, this presentation is mostly based on those studies. And if you are interested, uh, please um, go ahead and have a look at these uh, papers. And yeah, thank you for listening to me. I would like to answer if you have any questions. 
Uh, I hope it's not too much engineering uh, and not too few uh, computer science and data analysis, but yeah. Very interesting, Bara. Very informative and beautiful presentation. Thank you for, for that. So yeah, yeah now we have some time for, for questions. Yeah, feel free to use the chat or, or just uh, start to ask your question. So Mushtawa, maybe we can, at the moment, we can unmute the, the participants. So if they have questions, they can ask by themselves. Okay, I unmute all the participants and they can uh, ask their question if they have any question. We have 10 minutes uh, for Q&A uh, Q Q uh, session. So, Bora, I have one question. Yeah. In the slide 26, where, where you talk about renewating the uh, uh, electric grid components. This one? Yeah, this one. So, does it also matter which type of components we replace, like the, the switch, transformers, lines, or, or just a mix of different components? Uh yeah, of course, definitely. The, the component type is affecting the number of people are effect, uh, affected by the change. But what we did is, so let's say you have, um, uh, so be, what we did is be based on the age of the component. So if, for example, there's a circuit breaker older than 10 years in the, in the renewable components older than 10 years are changed. Right, those circuit breakers are changed, and it's the same thing applies to other types of components. So, uh, the, this is not in this presentation, but if you have a look at the paper, there is the mm. list of components, and they're like the median average age of these components. How many of them is older than five years? How many of them is older than ten years? So, uh, in here, we didn't differentiate based on the component type, but we differentiate based on the age of the component, regardless of the type. But you can imagine that it changing a circuit breaker and changing a, let's say, service point uh, component is not the same thing, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, Baran, it's also, I have the same question, uh, not simply from this slide, you know, did you also uh, study the cost of the component, for example, the, the quality of the component when you renew, renew? Is it, it's based on their age, I mean, or no? You... Yes, uh, this, this is totally based on the age, uh, but of course, yeah, the, you can use the same framework to do all different kinds of uh, scenarios, right? And uh, actually financial aspect is really an important part of it because everybody decides based on the budget, right? Uh, but essentially, yeah, the, it's, it's possible to do any, any kind of, uh, let's say policy decision, test policy decisions. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, one more question, you know, also about the commercial load, you say they are more resilient than residential load, you know, I didn't uh, understand well, can you clarify, uh, clarify it more, what mm -hmm. do you mean they are more resilient, because in terms of equipment they have or infrastructure? So, uh, so briefly commercial, I mean, the name suggests, but commercial uh, customers are the customers that have like a shop, you know, like different kinds of bars, restaurants can be also, but also the shops that sells clothes, for example. These are titled as the commercial customs and the residential customs are the res residents of the city. So uh, the, their resilience difference is not actually based on their own capabilities, but the based on the infrastructure network they are connected to. So uh, in United States, so this is not maybe really the case in, for example, it's not really the case in Netherlands, but in United States, uh, most of the infrastructure is really, uh, we can say maybe, I'm trying to find the right word, but we can say maybe simple or primitive, because you see lots of overhead lines. You see not many of the developed world, you won't see that many uh, overhead lines. And in the residential areas, this is my, uh, I say comment, it's not, I didn't see in the data, but uh, most of the residential areas have these overhead, very simple overhead lines. Yeah. So, and this, we are looking at a hurricane. So hurricanes are really impacting those uh, overhead lines. Uh, so 
I, what I think is probably most of the the, cost, the the commercial customers are served by the underground lines that because they are on the main road and so on. But the many of the residential uh, customers are served by overhead lines. So the, probably that is why there is just difference. Okay. But this is just uh, my uh, comment. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, one <laughs> one more question. You know? Yeah, go on. This. Yeah. About the Monte Carlo simulation you did, you said, for example, you will select 100 uh, scenarios and you said mm -hmm. we can also, the number, you know, is empirical, isn't it? Yeah, the number what? is really, is, uh, yeah, it can be one, if you do 1000, it might be better, but, but of course there, you can. Example, a research that, you know, a, a reasonable uh, number of the scenario, we can, if we, for example, select a low, uh, low number, it's not, uh, you know, maybe it's not acceptable. Or a very high number also come up with a, you know, high computational demand and also power. Yeah. So yeah. Is there, you know, did any, any research that, you know, find a trade-off or, you know? A... Uh, to be honest, I don't know uh, a research. So, but what you, what you can expect is uh, somehow actually you can find that sweet point that you need a number of simulations because after a while, it won't change anymore. So huh. basically in simulation, you see this difference. So at the end, when you do, for example, a hundred one, you basically average it out, right? To find like the, which customers will have most effect. So after a point, probably it won't change anymore, hmm. right? So if you try that, you can find these, uh, like what is the best number or like optimal number, let's say, to, to conduct this, these simulations. But uh, in, in this study, our purpose was to just try a large number of scenarios to see what happens because it's more oriented on the framework itself than the, uh, than, than the scenario outcomes, we can say. Uh, but yeah, for us, 100 scenarios was really a big number enough for us. But uh, yeah, I think it's possible to find that optimal point. Okay, we have one question from uh, Mohammad Reza. The question is that from your point of the from uh, from your point of the is it uh, possible to simulate the causal relation between failure components such as other uh, uncertainty sources like disaster based on the information theory or other database tools? If yes, if yes, what is the what is the best tool? Uh, I can ask you to repeat the question. I couldn't understand. Well. You can you can see also the question in the chat and you can read. Uh, just a second. The question is: Is it possible to simulate the causal relation between failure component and other uncertainty sources, like disaster? Uh, yeah, yeah. This is uh, so. Yeah, I understand. I think so. This is one of the. Uh, limitations, let's say, of the study is this is based on one hurricane, one disaster, right? So, uh, but actually we know that different disasters and different hurricanes, for example, can have different effects. So uh, as a future one, uh, yeah, I didn't want to go that part, but uh, as a future study, as an idea, we have uh, what happens if you model the uh, disaster probabilities as well. So you can also, for example, in the simulation, you can add uh, different sen uh, disaster scenarios as well. And of course, it's a probabilistic uh, thing as well. For example, in, in the case of Tallahassee, we always know that if there's a hurricane, it will come from southwest of the city because it's where it's facing the sea. Uh, but the, the, the angles, the types can change, right? So of course, this is uh, possible. And it's, I think it's important to do. Uh, especially if we want to do like we can say ex ante uh, analysis like before something happened we want to analyze and we want to see what would happen it's really important to include the different scenario disruption uh, types as well i think this this, this is the question right yeah very good so is there any other questions we have one more minute Okay. So very good, Baran. Thank you so much for your time. It was very, very interesting and we yeah, appreciate it. I hope it yes. was also the same for our, our audiences. And yes. as, 
the we recorded this uh, this talk and we will make this available on our YouTube channel HVL Data Science. And yeah, and looking forward to see you in uh, in other uh, webinars we will have in near yeah. future. Thank you, thank, thank you very you so much. much. Uh, so I also can thank you very much for this opportunity. Really, it was uh, nice presenting this um, uh, studies. Uh, so we will also, it's a kind of short notice, but we also uh, unfortunately can be sure about the time and everything in the short time. But uh, we will also have an event on Tuesday, 25th of May. Uh -huh. uh, about it's in the lunch time, so maybe some people can join in the lunch time. About uh, again resilience, but it's really nice and interesting uh, topic. It's about COVID, okay. and uh, it's about pandemics, resilience yeah. to pandemics. So uh, it's not data science, but uh, <laughs> if you are interested, I can share our flyer yeah, with you, Reza. Please. Maybe you can distribute if you if anybody wants to join. Awesome. There will be two researchers, one from uh, Hong Kong and one from in the Netherlands. Uh, and uh, they are really uh, prominent researchers in their area, health, health crisis management, governance, and those kind of uh, problems. And yeah, it will Absolutely. it will be an interesting event. So if you want to join, please welcome. Yeah, if you have the links for the events, please leave it in the chat here. Also, I will distribute it in our network. Okay. Uh,